Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to officially welcome you <laughs> to this uh, launch of State of the Nation Aspects of Australian Public Policy, which is the Menzies Research Centre's latest book. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge um, a number of people who are here. Senator Arthur Sinodinas, Shadow Parliamentary Secretary to the Leader of the Opposition, and of course the Director of the Menzies Research Centre. Um, South Australian Senator Simon Birmingham, who is Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Water. Um, former New South Wales Ministers Patricia Forsyth and Michael Fotius. Uh, my fellow directors of Menzies, uh, Paul Espy, Tony McClellan and May Kaur. And two members of uh, the Centre's Academic Advisory Council, Greg Mellish and uh, Henry Ergas. Our host this evening is John Azarias and many other representatives of his firm Deloitte are here. Thank you, John. We have many of the distinguished policy experts who've contributed to State of the Nation. And I'm going to mention all of them by name and ask them to stand up because it, it's a way of introducing you for the session we'll have later. Uh, Keith DeLacy. Um, <laughs> Dick Estens. As they say at the Olympics, you can hold the applause till the end. We'll do it all in one. <laughs> Patrick McClure. Um, Donald MacDonald. John Mendoza. Major General Jim Molan. Sorry, I'm being a bit fast here. <laughs> um, Kevin Morgan. Paul O'Sullivan. And Professor Stephen Schwartz, who I'm told was awarded his Order of Australia today at Government House. Congratulations, Stephen. <laughs> Uh, I also welcome their partners who've put up with them while they've been writing their chapters and who've come along here in support today. We're very grateful. All of the contributors to State of the Nation have donated their time, energy, and most importantly, their ideas to these, their chapters. And that's allowed to publish what I believe is a very significant contribution to public policy debate in this country. Uh, as well as being eminent policy experts in their own fields, they're all known for expressing their strong views on policy development and implementation over the last five years. State of the Nation is a collection of independent voices. We might not agree with every word or every conclusion reached by every one of the authors, but it's a book of ideas, and these ideas should be heard, discussed, and debated. I hope State of the Nation epitomizes the role that the Menzies Research Center is seeking to contribute to public policy development. We seek to provide a platform for nonpartisan experts to contribute in public and in private to public policy discussion. Policy, not politics, are the centre's mission. To paraphrase Gary Banks, the former head of the Productivity Commission, quoted in Don Markville's preface, good process in policy formation is the most important thing on Australia's to-do list for securing our nation's future. What contribution the centre makes is built upon the work of the centre's team. It's Executive Director Don Markwell, the Deputy Director Rachel Thompson. Rachel, where are you? There. I want to acknowledge Rachel particularly. Um, they are two of the editors of this book and I thank them both for their work in not only seeing this book through but also arranging tonight's forum. Uh, there's a third or editor of this book, uh, the kind of third leg of the Trinity, um, Julian Lisa, and it's my great pleasure to welcome him back to Menzies Research Centre. Um, where are you, Julian? Many of you know Julian because he was, he, it was the executive director, and it was during his time leading the centre that the idea of this book was born and began to take shape. Thank you, Julian, and your family for being with us here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the work of the centre would be impossible without the support of organisations like Deloitte's, uh, tonight's hosts. And we're very grateful to you, John, and to Deloitte for providing this opportunity for discussion of public policy. It's an example of the support for Menzies, which is essential, appreciated, and can make a real difference for Australia's future. There's another way we can do that. Um, the donations to the Menzies Research Centre, and there's a pamphlet on your table, are tax deductible. I say that boldly a week or so out from the budget, um, but uh, Wayne Swan can, 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 can co-contribute with you under current tax law. 
It's now my great pleasure to hand over to our panel host this evening. Paul Kelly is Australia's preeminent analyst and commentator on politics and history and international affairs. He's editor at large of, of the Australian and a regular uh, commentator on the Sky uh, news program, Australia and Agenda. What marks out Paul uh, from other public commentators is his passionate view that good policy is ultimately more important and enduring than clever politics. I sense that's a position shared by many of you tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hand over to Paul Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It's a great pleasure for me to be at this Menzies Research Centre policy discussion and to be on this platform with such a truly dazzling and diverse array of talent. Now, we've only got 45 minutes for this conversation, and of course, the interesting feature of this book and the interesting feature of our contributors tonight is that they are experts in a wide range of fields. So, I'm going to be fairly ruthless in leaping from one person to another and from one subject to another, and I won't hesitate to interrupt if I think that our dazzling and diverse contributors uh, are, are talking uh, too long and not, not being sufficiently lucid in terms of their policy ideas and contributions. Uh, this book is about micro-policy and macro-policy. It's surveying where we've come from over the last five years with a, with a lot of lessons about where we might be going over the next five years. I wanted to uh, start with uh, John Mendoza, who's been looking at the area of mental health. Uh, this is an area where there has been uh, tremendous uh, expectations raised uh, over the last five years. But what's the result? So, John, can you tell us uh, quickly what's the story here? What is the result uh, in terms of all the expectations raised about new mental health interventions? And what are the conclusions you draw from this period? Thanks, Paul. You surprised me by being first. That, that getting up quickly at the start was obviously an entree for what we have to do tonight. Um, look, uh, Gillard, you'll all recall, in the 2010 election made very clear, unequivocal commitment that mental health policy was a priority, or mental health reform was a priority in the second term of the... Uh, of the Gillard government, um, and that was very much in response to uh, a, a wide outcry of despair, I suppose, uh, from not only the mental health sector but other players in the health sector who realised that in the Rudd reform package that went to COAG in April of that year, that mental health had been pretty much dudded. Of the $16 billion in announcements in additional federal funding, $181 million, $181 million, was earmarked for mental health services. Less than 2% of the additional spend. Um, and given the burden of disease, given all the evidence that uh, had been accumulated over many years now about the structural problems we have in, in providing for the needs of the community in this area, um, diverse, challenging and changing, we were really way off scale, as Pat McGorry would say, in terms of really providing the sort of services that anyone, any age group, uh, needs in any place in Australia, even if you have well-resourced families with a real determination to get the care they need for their son or daughter or, or my, wife or whatever, they will struggle to get access to quality mental health services. Well, I think one of the issues that's in no your paper, now. I think one of the issues in your essay was failed implementation. Yeah. I wonder if you could just address that, because it seems to me this is a very important public policy theme at the moment across the board. It is, and the regrettable thing, and when I read Keith DeLacy's essay, I thought, well, you know, there's the same um, sort of parallel, if you like, in the mental health space. We've had the opportunity to do this right. We can look across the ditch at New Zealand. They've taken less time and they've done it more effectively with less money in terms of moving from an institutional model of mental health care to a community-based model. We've really failed, and the reasons for that are that we've allowed very confused lines of purchase a provider to prevail. Vested interests have continued to dictate what the system should actually be designed. So, you know, um, while there's been significant increases in spending, 
the quality of the spend has, is not there. We can't see the outcomes uh, in the data. And this is the big concern, that we've spent a lot of money. Uh, we're spending now about $6.5 billion a year on mental health services alone. That's not including all of the other um, uh, welfare payments and housing support payments, etc., uh, etc., et that are consumed uh, in this area. We're not getting good value for that investment, and I think there are very stark choices for the next government uh, in addressing this very chronic area of health need, uh, which has a very big productivity dividend if we get the investment right, uh, and we ensure that we aren't building those preventative services. So where we are now, Paul, in summary, is that many of those commitments that were made in that 2011 budget package, trumpeted as 2.2 billion of new funding, I can tell you now, the five biggest areas of spending in that, just to quickly say, the five big ticket items in that, not one of them is yet operational. Not one of them. Okay, well thank you very much. I want to go to Dick, because I think in your essay on rural and regional Australia, you've looked at some of these problems from a different perspective. You argue that there's a real problem of governance and that decisions are being imposed from a central government, from a national government in Canberra, on communities, and that this is a broken or defective model. Can you just give us a rundown of how you see the record over the last five years in this area? <coughs> Thanks, Paul. You know, it's very noticeable to us in the bush that the decision-making that's taken away from our local community yeah, and the constant centralised of control out of Canberra. You, know, you, you think back a you know, hundred years ago, in communities were the second most important gathering around the family unit. You know, in a community, if you had a family running into trouble, the community knew who had, who had to be helped and those that you let go and you help a little bit. You know, nowadays, all those decisions are taken over by people out of Canberra. Well, can you give us a couple of examples in terms of actual programs? Well, I have problems, you know, in a lot of ways with Centrelink. You know, these huge Centrelink offices that we're getting built in our towns and, and Centrelink managers are getting paid more money the more welfare they create in a community, the more staff they're allowed to employ. You know, in a lot of ways, I think a Centrelink office should be paid bonuses for lessening welfare in a community. Well, if we, look at, if we look at the problem, I, I think essentially this goes to power and governance. We're becoming a more urban country and more of our political power derives from urban-based arrangements. So what you're saying is we need to go back to a more devolved community-based model. Uh, how important is that and how do you think we achieve that? Well, I think one of the first things we should look at is our third tier of government around local shire councils. You know, there's a big push to amalgamate to get efficiencies, but we've got to be really careful in this exercise. We are not continuing to disempower the communities we live in. I think there needs to be a lot of debate around, you know, the structure of our local governments, how efficient do we want them. And I think, as I said in my book, that at some stage, the rate we're running now, we're going to run out of money paying bureaucrats to look after all our community issues. I think as we go forward, which I think they're finding out in Europe, You've got to hand back more power to the communities to handle the issues. Uh, just moving to Keith DeLacy. Keith, I think you've written the, the second uh, toughest essay. I've read virtually the whole book. Uh, and I think you're fairly scathing in terms of the management of the resources boom. What I wanted to do was try and deconstruct this a little bit. To what extent has this been a problem with taxation? You're very strong on the taxation area. To what extent has it been a problem in terms of macroeconomic management, uh, not getting the macroeconomic management of the resources boom right? Uh, what's the way you'd deconstruct that, assessing those two uh, general points? Uh, Paul, I, I don't think it is taxation. Taxation is a symptom um, rather than the cause of it all. Um, I despair about where Australia is going, and if you read my... Uh, essay, I think you'll um, understand why. And uh, having been involved, uh, intimately involved with the resources for the last, the resources industry for the last 10 years, I felt out there, not, not personally, but as a resources person, to be the enemy. 
uh, both by the comments that are made, the number, you're talking about tax, there's six separate new tax impositions on the resources industries in the last three or four years. I mean, people out there are feeling punch drunk and we know that there's more coming in, an, in another fortnight. The diesel tax offset, I'll bet you anything that um, that, that is reduced. Um, my concern about what's happening in Australia is that there are too many people alienated from what I call the productive sector, the people that are out there creating wealth because we need to create the wealth that the government's going to spend and other people are going to spend it. And there are too many people like that now. Um, it is obviously the political class, uh, with most of them now uh, career politicians without any experience of the real world. Uh, academia, uh, the public service, I think uh, particularly in Canberra now, you've got uh, third generation public servants that have had a job for life and uh, defined benefit superannuation schemes. They don't worry what happens to the market or interest rates or what have you. They don't know what's going on out there. Much of the mainstream media, uh, well, I won't go into details, but I think you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and the Save the World, um, the, you know, get up crowd. They're all, they see the resources sector in particular, but the productive sector in general, as being the enemy. Well, we used to say in the 1980s, we used to say in the 1980s that, that um, the question of uh, fairness and equity went hand in hand with economic growth. That is, the two actually went together, complemented one another and reinforced one another. You're clearly, I think, arguing that that uh, no longer exists in terms of the central thesis that you're putting. I mean, uh, what's the way that you'd analyse that? Is it simply that you think too much of an emphasis is now being put on redistribution? Uh, or are the causes more complex? Um, it's pretty tough out there. The resources industry has almost come to a, to a standstill. Uh, we are no longer internationally competitive. And ultimately, everybody will pay the price for that. Uh, this is them and us, you know, the, the, the class war sort of rhetoric and the redistributive uh, zeal. Um, they'll find one day when that wealth is not being created that there's nothing left to distribute. They always say that uh, you cannot distribute what the economy does not produce. Some people think you can distribute by taking it off uh, Paul and giving to Peter. George Bernard Shaw once said that um, uh, if, if you take it off Paul and give to Peter, you can bet that Peter will vote for you. And the trouble is these days I think there's more Peters than Pauls. So um, uh, unless somebody starts to understand and supports that area that's going to create the wealth, uh, ensure that we have productivity, and we all talk productivity, the average per we haven't sold it well. The average person out there uh, thinks it's, uh, and the average worker thinks it means, uh, you know, less pay and, and, and less conditions. And so well, in terms, of, in terms of the way you see things, you said that we're not competitive. We're not competitive in the resources sector, yet this is where we're supposed to be state-of-the-art. So what are the critical policy areas that have been responsible for eroding that competitiveness? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. It's, it's this massive growth in regulations, uh, this intrusive regulations. It, it is almost impossible. Um, I often tell the story. MacArthur Coal, uh, of which I was the chairman uh, for 10 years, uh, when it started in... Um, uh, 1999, um, it took 15 months from identification of the resource to commencement of production and less than $100 million investment. Today, it would take five years minimum and a billion dollars to do exactly the same thing. Now, we talk about productivity. Well, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out that capital productivity is not too good when you've got so much money tied up for so long without generating a, um, a, a return. So it's regulation. We need to have a look at the red tape, the green tape. It is just stifling business, and particularly the resources center, uh, sector, but not just the resources sector. Well, I'd like now to switch to uh, Kevin Morgan uh, and look at the NBN, uh, because this is another area uh, that goes to uh, delineation of responsibilities uh, public sector versus private sector. So just looking at uh, the NBN and in the context of the discussion we've just had, uh, what's your assessment uh, about the, the drivers of policy here and the way you would evaluate the outcome to this stage? Well, can I start with uh, yeah, the, 
raw numbers on it. You know, the, the policy in 2007 the Labor Party took to the election was 98% uh, of homes getting high speed broadband for $4.7 billion. Today, MBN Co has connected less than 30,000 homes, spent $2.5 billion, and committed another $6.5 billion, and is falling further and further behind. So it's an absolute debacle. And it's actually uh, the only way you could describe, make sense of the policy is it's become sort of cargo court for the Labor Party now. Or all ills will be solved by the MBN, which of course they won't. So um, that, that's the raw numbers on it. This is a total policy failure. And it was a policy failure because, of course, it was born in failure. When the first policy, the 4.7 billion policy, collapsed, as it inevitably would have collapsed, uh, that was predicated upon the government tendering out the right to upgrade the Telstra network, which they didn't own. And they hadn't actually asked Telstra if they would like that done to it. Um, so that, that fell over. Now, rather than sort of admit that this was a debacle, um, it was buried. And if you remember the press conference in April 2009 with the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, 800 words committed this country to a $43 billion project. I don't know how many, how much that's per word, but it's a hell of a lot per word, I can tell you. So um, there was no, as we know, there was no cost-benefit analysis. There was no modelling of any sort. It was just an act of faith, and it was to bury a policy failure. Well, this is an area where we have had the release of the coalition policy. The coalition broadband policy came out a few weeks ago with uh, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull uh, explaining uh, what their agenda was in terms of uh, completing uh, the NBN or a different, uh, different uh, sort of NBN with uh, different uh, technology and uh, different processes. What's your assessment of that opposition policy? Well, I mean, given where, you know, Malcolm Turnbull has that line, which is, you know, the Irish country, you go into the Irish country pub and you ask for directions to Dublin, and the public says, oh, well, I wouldn't be starting here. Um, <laughs> but frankly, with the MBA, I think what, what uh, Mr Turnbull and Mr Overby find when they get into government is what the publican would really say if you went into a pub in Kerry and said, how do I get to Dublin? He said, why would you be wanting to go there? <laughs> um, uh, you know, so where should they be going then if they're not going to Dublin? <laughs> well, look, I, I can understand this policy it, 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 out of the wreckage that's been left. Not so much a, a minefield. This is absolutely booby-trapped <coughs> uh, for the incoming government uh, with contractual commitments of about nine, you know, either spent or nine billions committed to almost no purpose. So that's, that's a very difficult place to start from. It's also had $200 million spent on promoting it find a bit gobsmacking, but that's advertising, uh, community hands outs, over $200 million. So it's a popular policy. Uh, they've marketed something which doesn't exist. So it's, it's, I can understand the coalition has to go with the flow to a point, but I think once coming into government, I'd like to see a return to what was a 30 odd year consensus in, in politics in Australia, that you got the government out of this sector. That was started under the Whitlam government, continued under the Fraser government, and even, you know, even the privatisation of Telstra, the, the, the Labor Party's opposition to that was uh, a little uh, less than honest, actually. It was, Keating was opposed to it because he got a $100,000 election commitment from the union I used to work for, and he said, I won't privatise it. So that was the depth of that uh, commitment. So, you know, we had a 30-odd year policy which worked very well, we had good outcomes. We do not have, did not have, as Senator Conroy keeps telling us the world's worst telecoms networks, world's worst broadband, and so on and so forth, given the market and what this industry has done, it's been a great achievement. So I think really, on coming back to government, we, we might see the MBN become a sort of little uh, residual rump uh, that uh, is just clearing up some of the mess. And if you can get the regulatory settings right, you'll be doing what's happening in Germany with the kind of technology that the opposition is talking about, or in the UK with that sort of technology, or in the US. So it, it's a question of regulation as much as anything else, I think. Uh, one of the features of um, public policy over the last five years has been the emphasis on social policy, if you like, social democracy, uh, coming off the back of commitments such as uh, Gonski, uh, commitments in mental health, and uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So I'd like uh, to turn to Patrick McClure. Now, I know, Patrick, in your essay, you didn't deal with the National Disability Insurance Scheme you've dealt with the welfare sector, but I wanted to raise this with both uh, yourself and John tonight because it's very much up there in lights at the moment. 
Uh, to what extent do you think the government is going in the right direction with the National Disability Insurance Scheme and what might be some of the pitfalls in this approach? Well, there's a recognition in the community that people with a severe disability are some of the most vulnerable uh, people in the community, um, Paul, and uh, certainly their carers, often their parents, and the individual and themselves have suffered from the uncertainty of funding. And as you could imagine, if you're a parent, uh, 70s or 80s, you've got a 50-year-old son or daughter, and you're passing on, what, what, what will happen? What, what's going to be the outcome, the quality of life for this individual? Often in the past, they've gone into aged care facilities, which are quite inappropriate. So what the Disability Insurance Scheme has sought to do is to provide, one, certainty of funding based on an assessment of an individual's needs. And that's really looking at some outcomes um, in terms of quality of accommodation, quality of care, uh, pathways to education and employment. The, the big question, though, that uh, is in everyone's minds, and I think certainly uh, the BCA's come out as well with that, is that there's, there's not enough um, attention to detail. We don't know the details of and, and how those outcomes will be met. So there's a degree of uncertainty about the framework of the national disability. The second one is the funding, and uh, it's an expensive model. They've come up with 0.5 of 1% um, as a levy uh, on, on all Australians, similar to the Medicare levy. Um, that's probably going to be insufficient funding. And so there's the question mark, yes, in principle, we agree with it. Um, is it affordable given the current fiscal constraints? Um, and that's, that's the question. Plus also, we need to see a lot more details. And I think that's exactly um, the conversation that um, uh, Coalition will be having with government as well as um, um, major players um, you know, across society. John, I wonder if we could get a quick postscript from you on that, uh, from your perspective. Uh, what's your assessment of the NDIS? Look, I agree with everything you know, Patrick said there, Paul. Um, it's a bit of a no-brainer. We, we need some form of uh, safety net for people with severe, <laughs> lifelong, uh, or you know, a very chronic episodic illness. Uh, MS is a good example of that, as well as as well as schizophrenia. Um, we need that sort of system in place. That's a, that's the no-brainer bit. But I agree with Paul, uh, with Patrick. 100% that based on the trials that are now underway, it is way too early to commit to uh, rolling out the NDIS at the speed the government's announced. Uh, the Geelong trial, I'm familiar with the players there, I'm involved with some of the organisations, similarly in the ACT. And the level of confusion and complexity uh, in doing this is quite um, extreme. Uh, organisations need both the state government uh, bodies, the local NGOs, etc., the families concerned, they need time to work through these issues and really you know, work out what is the right service array for the different types of disability that we're starting to deal with you know, under uh, an NDIS. So we need more time uh, to evaluate it. I think the commitment uh, by the Prime Minister is, is you know, commendable but premature in a sense. Well, I, think that's an important, uh, I think that's an important reflection. One of the um, interesting public policy features in over the last several years has been the nexus established between investment in education and uh, the belief that this will lead to uh, superior GDP outcomes. Uh, and we've seen this uh, with great reference to uh, school funding and university funding. I'd like to uh, bring uh, Stephen Swartz into the discussion now. Uh, perhaps at two levels. I wonder what your reflection is on that particular nexus, which we hear so much about these days. And as a follow-up question, I think you've addressed the university funding model in your essay, and it's a model that seems to me, from what you're arguing, that's virtually now reached the limits of its viability. So uh, could you address that second point as well for us? Uh, thanks, Paul. I'll start with the first one. Uh, it is the received wisdom, and I think not just in Australia, but in most countries around the world, that education increases productivity. And of course it does, and I don't think anyone would argue with it. But the idea that if you continue 
to have more and more uh, universities and more and more students, that each one of them will contribute to the growth of the GDP is a bit of an exaggeration. It's a bit like saying one aspirin's good for you, so 10 must be even better. Uh, <laughs> if the entire country had law degrees, would we actually be a pro more productive? <laughs> you can ask yourself that question, and you know the answer. What, and there are just as many counterexamples. So Switzerland, for example, is probably the lowest spender in the OECD on higher education, and yet it has a very strong economy. Um, the Americans have the most famous universities in the world, and, and rightfully so, and yet their GDP has hardly budged in the last decade. The Russians have the highest number of graduates of any country in Europe, and nobody would want to copy their uh, economy. That the economy is more complicated than just having more graduates. Uh, it's about uh, entrepreneurialism. It's about the availability of money. It's about infrastructure. It's about lots of other things. Taxes. This is only one one part of it. So by itself, I don't think it can can actually guarantee the GDP will grow and grow. But that's what everyone thinks. There is another reason, though, for sending students to university, isn't there? And that's to give them the opportunity to achieve their potential, to reach their potential, to, uh, to make their contribution to society, to become more cultured, to learn about themselves and about their place in the world. All of those are good things as well. The question is who pays for it? Um, and we're now in a situation where universities are very, very expensive. It's about $23 billion a year uh, in private and public expenditures are going into universities. And there are at least half a dozen universities in Australia who have revenues over a billion dollars a year. They're very big organizations. Uh, they're growing, and the major policy initiative of the last uh, five or seven years was the re removal of enrollment caps. So there really is no limit now to the number of students who can be enrolled at universities. And not surprisingly, because each, each student brings money, universities have expanded and expanded, and they're taking many students who would not formally go to university, many of whom would have formally gone to TAFE. And this has decimated TAFEs in Australia. So the, you know, the states have not really argued too much about it because they pay for TAFEs, but the Commonwealth pays for university. So if more and more students go to university not to TAFE, the states are not likely to complain. Um, but it's, we have to ask ourselves whether that sort of perverse outcome is actually what Australia needs. More and more uh, if forensic science graduates and um, social studies graduates, and nobody going into TAFEs. So I do think that the model is, has broken down. It's now reached a limit where it's probably too expensive for the taxpayer. We've already seen cuts foreshadowed uh, for next year and the year after that in university budgets. Something's got to give. At the same time, there is a, a, a movement going on around the world, and that's online education. For years and years, people have been predicting we can deliver good education online and nothing happened. Just nothing. And it went on and on. People kept saying, Wait, what's going to happen? And we waited and waited. And now suddenly, it's taken off. And Open Universities Australia doubled its student numbers, doubled them again, and now it's doubled them again. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, Berkeley, Stanford, universities that are world known are now offering online education cheaper than anyone could offer it in a university. Now, maybe it's not good for everything. Maybe there are some things that wouldn't be appropriate. But surely, first year calculus, statistics, things like that could easily be taught much cheaper than they are now. Um, can be taught in ways that may be even more effective than they are now. And I can see that this is now an idea as time has come for. Uh, none of our universities are really ready for it. I think they might get run over by this internet train if they're not careful. Well, that's a very uh, interesting uh, final point there about, uh, about technology and how it's going to transform university teaching and presumably costs. Donald McDonald, when we, when we think of uh, arts and culture, a lot of people think of public subsidies. Um, uh, is the uh, Australian uh, arts and culture sector uh, forever going to be dependent on public subsidies? And should uh, those subsidies be increased as a sign of support for the sector or decreased after a review by the Productivity Commission? The answer is yes to a second <laughs> proposition. Uh, I uh, reread my uh, essay today. I thought it was really quite elegant, but it was a bit gentle. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's a failure of my style, eh? <laughs> I wouldn't spend another cent on the arts and culture if we will roll that into it uh, without some really clear-headed analysis. 
Uh, I, uh, if people want to do creative writing courses, let them do them and let them pay for public broadcasting into this too. I rather uh, sloppily use the phrase, well, how long is a piece of string? But really, these are areas where you can keep on spending without measuring what the benefit is. And I think that the internet that uh, uh, Stephen has been speaking about, the effect that it is already having on creativity and communication of ideas make a lot of our models of institutions and their funding uh, really not completely outmoded, but their time is passing. I'd like to ask you whether we need a culture policy, but perhaps we could put that uh, on ice. We'll have questions from the audience in about 10 minutes, but I've now got to go to uh, our foreign affairs and defence experts uh, on the panel. Uh, that is uh, Paul O'Sullivan and uh, Jim Molan. Uh, Jim, you've written what I think is uh, the most uh, vitriolic of all the essays in the publication uh, concerning defence policy. You argue, you argue that if we keep on going the way we are, then the situation will be terminal and we will not be able to reverse the damage being done to uh, Australian defence policy. So uh, can I just ask you to identify what you see as, as the, central, the central problems and when it comes to the budget, um, what is uh, a tolerable budget for defence as far as you're concerned? Paul, thank you. Uh, I, I thought I was rather elegant as well, actually. <laughs> uh, I, 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 would, I don't quite say what you said, Paul. I believe that we are in a state of terminal decline, and I define terminal decline of the defence force at 1.5% of, of GDP. As a state where you let the defence force deteriorate so much that it takes you an unreasonable period of time to recover. Uh, and that's an important point because you can always manage risk and you can always sensibly look at defence. But uh, I think the central issue that we get wrong is that there is no way of judging risk. We, the voters, cannot make a decision about the risk that government takes on our behalf. And I have been a consumer of defence policy and defence strategy as a soldier for 40 years, and I don't think we've ever got it right. The irony is that for the last 40 or 50 years, it hasn't really mattered. For the simple reason that we in Australia for that period of time have been at the end of the world, and all the conflicts were a long way away, and we could take as much time as we wanted to go to those conflicts if we wanted to go to those conflicts. Also, if we got it wrong in defence, we always had our big ally nearby. I believe those two things have now changed. Uh, the relative power of the US is declining and its allies may actually have to do something for themselves. That's the first point. The second point is that the Australian, the Australian continent now sits almost at the centre of the geostrategic centre, almost at the centre of the geostrategic point of the world being the, the Malacca Straits defined by the energy flows going from the Middle East through the Indian Ocean and up into our major, our, our major allies. So if the one thing that we have got to get right is we've got to align the policy and the strategy with what the ADF, which provides most of the defence capacity, uh, uh, can do. And, and that is not an impossible task. Paul, I would use one figure, and although we should never uh, we, we should define these things by the outcomes and not by the inputs, that is the number of tanks and planes and ships. I would certainly say that as a shorthand, Australia does not need to spend at this stage more than 2%. Uh, it got close to that in the only time we've got defence relatively right and that was during the later years of the Howard Government. Well, it's a significant increase on where we are now and of course it comes at a time when the budget is in difficulty, the budget's in difficulty today, It'll be in difficulty for the medium term. And one of the great challenges uh, for the government elected in September will be to determine priorities. Uh, Paul O'Sullivan, do you think we should be spending more on defence? Or do you think that we're going to get a better bang for the buck in terms of the national interest looking elsewhere? And I guess a follow-up question to you is, 
In terms of a new government uh, coming in after September, what are the principal foreign policy uh, mileposts that they should be guided by? Uh, on the first question, um, I think that uh, the country in Australia's strategic circumstances, uh, with the uh, uncertainties that Jim has alluded to concerning the projection of American power, spending less than 1.5% on GDP is not, is not a uh, sensible judgment. Uh, in fact, I think that um, getting towards 2% is going to be quite an effort for the incoming government. It's one, of the, one of the lessons over the past 30, 40 years is that it's quite difficult to spend money sensibly on defence. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning, and a lot of coordination. Uh, it's, it's a really complex set of issues, and s s getting a percentage increase from uh, the current uh, sub 1.5 percentage uh, up towards 2 percent is going to be quite an effort, I think. Uh, uh, hopefully an incoming government will have a, make a serious stab at it and start thinking in longer term uh, strategic uh, terms, longer than three years, that is. Um, on the second question about priorities for an incoming government uh, in foreign policy, uh, as I set out in the essay, uh, my view is that uh, what we need is stability and fundamental choices combined with tacti tactical flexibility and cleverness in the way we pursue them. Uh, what that means in practice, of course, is a matter for the incoming government to determine. But uh, it seems to me that a prime minister who decided to go to Romania rather than Japan would not, not be a good idea. Or, or to have a prime minister make a statement that uh, foreign policy was not my passion would not be a good idea. Uh, so I think that there are some lessons for the incoming government. And I think the priorities uh, ought, to, ought to, broadly speaking, be stable over time. That is to say, Australia's foreign interests shouldn't shift dramatically with a change of government. Well, thank you very much. I think we should now go to the floor. We've got uh, a few minutes left, so I'm happy to take questions. I think it's important to identify the panellist uh, you would like to uh, answer the question and also identify yourself. We've got a microphone on the floor. Questions, yes. Uh, Paul, can I direct a question to you? Uh, no, no, to no, no, you can't. Because <laughs> I think you've, got, a, you've, it's, you've it's, got to direct a question to the panel. Well, you're the panel. It is no. a question. Why is it that we've been able to go through this period of the Gillard and Rudd governments, which? Um, I think most people here would say it's been, has been a disaster for the country. Why have we not had the public service, that the permanent heads and whatever, giving much better advice to the government of the day? I'm going to ask uh, Paul O'Sullivan uh, to <laughs> address that. Uh, Paul, as uh, a public servant of 40 years standing, he's headed instrumentalities, advised prime ministers. What's your feeling about that, Paul? Well, first of all, it, uh, the question assumes that the advice wasn't uh, correctly given, and I think that's a highly, highly uh, debatable question. Uh, I think most, uh, I mean, if you look at um, the cabinet papers that are released over time, you can see, uh, even after the, under the 30-year rule, you can see the quality of advice that goes to government is generally fairly good. In fact, um, former chairman of Westpac, who himself had been a secretary of the Treasury, said to me once that the uh, quality of cabinet papers in his time that went to the government were better than the board papers that came to Westpac. So, I mean, I think it's a, I don't think you can assume that uh, proper and careful and uh, well-based uh, advice doesn't go to government. Uh, the, the question, however, uh, that's been raised uh, by commentary in the panel already is that uh, it's not necessarily a question of what advice goes to government, it's a question of what decisions are made by government, what context uh, those decisions are evaluated in, and as I was saying about defence policy, uh, what strategic planning and careful advising over time is put into decision making so that the left hand and the right hand know what they're doing and can plan accordingly. So it's, I think it's a, it's a pretty long bow to say that our current uh, condition is determined by failure of advice. Uh, thanks, Paul. Back to the floor. Further questions? Bob, Bob Wielden, um, I'm involved in rural Australia. Uh, I'd like to concur with uh, Mr. De Lacey's comments about the attack on 
productive center, sector of the economy. And I'd like to ask Mr Essens whether he concurs that there has been this attack on the agriculture sector, sector in the last area in terms of water, natural resources, policies and the like. I absolutely agree. You know, I'm a farmer and, and the costs we've been hitting with and the regulation's huge. Like, you know, electricity's one, you know, network charges. You know, it's added $100,000 to my bill this year. It's a shocker. The, uh, you know, the, the green tape, you know, to pull a few trees down to get more productivity is huge. It's, uh, it's a real problem going forward. You know, I think agriculture is about 34 billion in exports against 200 billion in mining. We're just big players now. You know, they're focusing on, I noticed there was a big conference in Melbourne run by the Australian, one of your group. But uh, Paul, you know, said we've got all this, you know, we can supply all this food to the world. You know, how do we do it? How do we develop a paddock up in northern Australia? We've got, we can't even do that now. We've had a committee in the last government to identify what can be done up there, but still we haven't started. You know, I think it's more, there's a lot of can't do in this country. We've got to, I think, bring the American engineers in that, get them to do it for us. That's what the stage we're getting to. It's not good. Other question? Uh, right. Uh, 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 my name is Raymond Kwan. I'm, I refer uh, I'm referring to the speaker in regards to the National Disability Insurance Scheme and also the uh, welfare. Uh, last month, uh, Rupert Murdoch was at a dinner speaking that uh, the argument for greater, less government spending and, and so forth more on the free market, uh, one should argue more, the challenge now is more talking about fairness and compassion and along those lines. And, and the question I, I'm wondering is that whether the such research is such as, is it with all that extra spending and welfare, has more people now come off uh, or are now living or are coming, uh, sorry, um, now coming off the poverty line or coming and so forth, and there's less people under the poverty line? Or, and we want to also know is that is it fair for someone doing a part-time job, earning $400 or paying taxes, and someone who's on welfare on a series of programs collecting $600 worth of benefits while someone's working fine? Okay, so Patrick, whether we can I'm argue not... along those lines. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Patrick, I wonder if I could uh, throw to you, this is very much uh, uh, in your domain, I think. Yes, certainly. Uh, well, when I did welfare reform for the Howard government, what we introduced was the notion of mutual obligation, which was something quite new, very controversial at the time, but it meant that anyone who's got, if anyone has the capacity to work, that they're on the radar screen, that they need to be involved in some sort of job search, work experience, um, or education and training if they were to receive benefit. And that um, model has uh, certainly continued in Australia, and in that sense, it is outcome driven that uh, most benefits received, um, mainly you know, particularly the New Start allowance, is very much predicated on the fact that you're either looking for a job and it's also seen as um, a pathway into some form of education and employment. The, the problem we face a bit in Australia though is that our system is very complex. So for instance, if you're on a disability support pension, you get paid about $140 more than if you're on an unemployment new start allowance. And so there's quite a disincentive at times for people to go off a pension in order to look for work because they fear that, oh, look, if it's not successful, they might, um, you know, sort of uh, obviously lose $140 a week, which makes, you know, reduces them to, uh, you know, very poor circumstances. And so one of the challenges, and it's one that, um, we recommended during the Howard government years and Henry report also recommended was moving towards a single integrated payment. So you'd have a base payment 
for everyone and then add-ons for particular needs. So if a person had a disability nor costs involved, that would be added on. If a person had housing needs, that could be added on. And in that way, at least we would have a fairer system and there'd be much more incentives for people to get into jobs. In terms of whether we've been successful, it's, you know, it's a, a mixed bag. One of the success areas is an Indigenous employment, where we have an Indigenous employment program, and quite a number of corporates. There's a, an Australian Employment Covenant um, that uh, you know, Twiggy Forest was involved with, where um, corporations guarantee jobs to Indigenous people if they're prepared to do appropriate training and education through um, training centres. Now, that's led to uh, 15,000 or so jobs. In addition, um, there's a number of uh, models, Rio Tinto taking uh, people from local communities, indigenous people in, into jobs. Coles has done the same thing. So there's models that, that do work within the community. Another one that's, that's a concern is obviously indigenous communities that are dysfunctional and the income management program was introduced where basically it said to families, look, unless you're functioning effectively, 50% of your income is going to be used for only uh, uh, paying for necessities, uh, um, food, housing, utilities, um, uh, and so on. And um, there's also constraints. In fact, you know, your children need to be going to school, they need to be in childcare otherwise. And uh, again, it's early days to be able to judge that, but um, you know, some of the outcomes have been quite good. Certainly a lot, the stores are reporting that uh, uh, there's much more healthier food that's being uh, you know, consumed and sold, that um, certainly the um, life expectations of Aboriginal children under five have improved. In Cape York, uh, under Noel Pearson, uh, some of the education outcomes have been quite good. So Australia is a bit of a mixed bag, but certainly we're a leader in terms of mutual obligation. That is that no longer can you expect just to get a payment, per se. Uh, the, what most Australians think is fair and reasonable is that uh, if you've got the capacity for work, you should be looking for it or at least involved in some sort of uh, training. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, back to the floor, I think, yes. I have a question for Mr DeLacy. I really enjoyed both your essay and also your, your comments about the um, reduction in, in look productivity because of the, the mining, you know, the, the slowdown, the mining boom. And I think it's obvious to everyone that the mining boom and the, the glory days are over that things are going to get tougher. My question is, what's happened to Mitch Hook? When we were talk, talking about the, um, the, um, the profits tax, we saw the mining industry on the front foot and in every paper and running a really aggressive and I think a really successful public campaign putting the views of the mining industry forward. And I just see over the last two years as the mining industry has taken more government regulation, more negative um, public attacks, that we're not hearing anything from the mining industry again. The industry generally, the industry generally has get involved in those things. The, um, the campaign against the RSPT was very specific. I mean, that was a game changer, that one. That would have just stopped the whole of the industry. We would have been paying at MacArthur Coal 60% of our profits in tax. And, and you know, uh, internationally uncompetitive like you wouldn't believe. So that just couldn't be allowed to go ahead. Everything else is too diffuse. Uh, there has been a, the um, uh, Australian Minerals Council has been running a bit of a campaign, but yes, you're right. Uh, we need to make our case, but always make our case in such a way that everybody benefits. Uh, our problem is, as we, the average person out there say, oh, bloody mining industry, you'd expect them to say that, they're making that much money, you know, and they only care about themselves. We've got to get the message across that improved productivity and improved wealth, increased wealth, creates jobs, increases national incomes for everyone, increases revenue to the government so they can deliver their social dividend. Uh, I agree with you. We, we've really got to get on the front foot more there instead of just being the subject of everybody's criticism. Further questions? Yes. Yeah, Dick Ward. Dick. Uh, well, the key thing, see, this is not the key to this skills and knowledge in the mining area, but switching from skills and knowledge in the agriculture area. Um, I was uh, chairman of a, uh, an agriculture program with Darling Girl, and we found that seeking uh, equity from Australian uh, firms was almost impossible. We, we would get good hearing, good understanding, but when they're right in the road, they just want to get the money. So we, Find the same experience. 
experience. And secondly, what do you feel about that? Um, that kind of I think it's essential. Um, I agree with you. I don't think Australian capital markets are ready for investing in, in any big way. Uh, I'm going to put the acid test on them in, with the two hats I'm wearing now, um, uh, um, two agriculture or agribusiness um, uh, enterprises, one of them very big, a big irrigation and farming place, $2 billion one. That'll test them to see whether all their talk is fair dinkum. But um, uh, uh, Foreign investment, Australia has always needed foreign investment. We've always depended on it, a big country. We don't have the capital formation within this country. What we need to grow up about foreign investment, for Christ's sake. There are absolutely no negatives for Australia, no. And all positives, they are all positives. You know, we get the money flow, we get the development out. They can't take the farms back home. Uh, they can't, um, they, they talk about, um, you know, we're losing our um, sovereignty. Bloody sovereignty. The sovereignty of this country is vested in the parliament and in the legal system and so forth. Anybody investing out here has, has got to comply with our laws, our customs. What, and, you know, Cubby, I was chairman of Cubby. Uh, it's now been taken over by largely a Chinese firm. People out at St George don't know the difference. It's the same management is still there. It's just been recapitalised and they've got a future. So. That is one of the debates that's going on in this country that just leaves me gobsmacked. We really need to grow up. I might ask uh, Dick to make a contribution to this question as well. Yeah, <coughs> there is simply not enough money in agriculture at the moment. And the last or the first decade of this century, you know, knocked a lot of our family farmers around and coupled with the high dollar has done real damage. And I agree we need more capital coming in but the farming game's a long-term game. It's a long, there's no short-term money in it. It's a long-term game with long-term thinking. We've got great markets to the north of us. You know, I'm in the middle of a major development at the moment and you know, vertically integrated business and it's tough going. But you, know, you talk to people, they want big returns in the first year. They're not prepared to wait for three or four years down the road. And that's what's required. I think the British did it years ago when they were in Australia in agriculture. They took the long-term view, and that's what it is. You know, over a 10-year period or a 20-year period, you get a good return, a good solid return. It's better than putting just, your money into superannuation. Yeah. Can I just make that. one quick comment about that? I often say this to farming groups, but um, like the two old farmers, uh, Fred and Jack, talking, what would you do, Fred, if you won the gold lotto? Oh, he said, I don't know, Jack. He said, I guess I'd keep farming until it was all gone. <laughs> okay, we might take uh, <laughs> we might take one final question now. We're running a bit over time, but we'll do one one final question from the floor. Sovereign risk. Um, you know, clearly, a lot of things have happened uh, over the last several years. Um, it really makes Australia a less attractive place to invest, but it's, it's really the changes in so many policies um, that's turning people off. Do you see Australia's sovereign risk having risen considerably? Oh, investors? absolutely. Um, it's um, um, the, the greatest crime you can commit in respect of sovereign risk is to change the rules after the investment has been made. And that has what has happened. Uh, if you want to have a large tax or you want to do this and that, and that's what the rules are when people invest, they may not invest. But changing it after they've invested is the worst thing you can do. And as I said, we've had six new tax increases in, um, in the resources sector in the last three years, but, and a million other things. So Australia's reputation as a reliable uh, investment destination has deteriorated quite substantially and there, there are some international studies which, which bear that out. Uh, Don, I'll pass over to you now. Paul, thank you very much indeed to you and to all of our contributors. To thank you more fully, I'd like to call on our host here at Deloitte this evening, a partner at Deloitte, a great supporter of our efforts through the Menzies Research Centre to promote the kind of debate we've, and discussion we've had tonight, John Azarius. Thank you very much.
very much, Don. And thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to listen in on the workings of the incisive mind that belongs to one of the foremost public intellectuals in Australia. For a number of years, uh, Tom and uh, Don, Deloitte has been proud to support the Menzies Research Centre and to help contribute to public debate in this country. With its latest publication, the Centre has presented a thought-provoking and detailed contribution to that debate. I hope it generates the discussion its serious intent deserves. Thanks again, Paul, for a most stimulating contribution to an informed exchange of ideas in Australia. And on behalf of the Menzies Research Centre, I have this.